welcome to the Climax the seminar series, session number four. We're going to start in a minute. Let me just, can everybody see my screen well? Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Athanasius Nenis and uh, I'm going to be coordinating the seminar session today. Um, this is the fourth uh, session of the Climax Seminar Series. And um, before we start, I would just like to uh, say a few rules just to remind everybody. We're, this is a part of one of the pillars of Climax, which is the newly founded center between EPFL and UNIL. And it's to highlight climate research and teaching and to raise ambitions and uh, ambition on climate action. And the seminar series takes place every um, second Monday, more or less, uh, between 12 and 1 p.m. And uh, we host two speakers every time, one from O'Neill and one from EPFL or external speakers. And the idea is to have challenging seminars that you know, are cross-cutting and uh, have the goal of raising ambition and going beyond on all what's already done. Uh, uh, of course, as every seminar series, please uh, keep your microphone and your video off uh, while the uh, speaker is speaking. But of course, you know, when there are going to be questions, you will be able to turn them on and ask the question. Of course, everybody be polite and kind. Um, please, uh, again, uh, use the private chat primarily for uh, posing questions. Uh, the seminars are recorded and they will be posted online. And of course, to ask questions, either you can raise your hand, uh, type in them in the chat, or um, at some point you can just open the mic and ask, we'll see. The seminars are bilingual, uh, in English or French, and according to Swiss tradition, each person can use their own language. So we've had a number of very interesting seminars so far, and please, we refer to the YouTube channel where you can see them recorded. Uh, the links will be posted on the chat, and uh, so for your reference. But today we have the pleasure of uh, having two speakers, um, one from UNIL and one from EPFL. The first speaker is going to be Sam Jacquard, who is a, a professor, uh, assistant professor at the Institute of Earth Sciences at UNIL. And uh, with that, I would like uh, to welcome Sam. Sam, you can start whenever you would like, whenever you're available. Yes, uh, bonjour à toutes, bonjour à tous. I'd just going to share my screen. Yes. Can you all see it? Very well. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction. And so I'll have my my semi seminar in English today, but uh, I'm very happy for you to ask a question in in French uh, as well at the end. So um, I'm going to cover a quite uh, fascinating topic, and and to be honest, it's not exactly my uh, subject of research. So I had to do um, uh, quite a bit of literature, literature research, and it, it, it's a very interesting topic. And especially, it's interesting to see how it uh, evolved uh, through time with with the very high hopes, and then also uh, some uh, deception. So I hope I won't uh, disappoint you too much at the end of the of the seminar. So I'll be covering a few uh, topics. Um, so. The first, why do we need uh, negative emissions or, ca or carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere? Why we think we can use the ocean to dispose of CO2? I'll give you a, 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 a very short and very brief introduction on, on ocean biogeochemistry and, and which parameters we can use in the ocean um, to affect or, or to play with the carbon cycle. And then I'll, I'll discuss like two main uh, topics. Uh, one is the iron fertilization of the marine biological carbon pump. Um, which uh, got a lot of traction in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s and essentially disappeared from the table ever since. Uh, and as a matter of fact, many uh, companies were created uh, in the early 2000s in order to uh, develop business out of it. And, and as far as I know, uh, most of them, if not all of them, went bust now. And then uh, the second topic will be dealing with ocean alkalinization or enhanced weathering, which is the second a topic which is gaining a lot of traction at the moment, but that, as you will see, um, this is a method that still needs a lot of development. Right, so why do we need negative emissions? Um, so this is a, a figure showing uh, the projections. So we have the actual emissions between 
the actual uh, CO2 emissions between um, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and, and 2010 here, and then projections based on different scenarios. So essentially there are different scenarios taking into account different so socio-economical uh, development. Uh, the red one is uh, business as usual, and hopefully we won't uh, follow uh, that path uh, too, for too long. Then dif different scenarios depending on how societies are ready uh, to adapt. And actually the, the most um, promising or the most, uh, uh, yeah, so, so the, the scenarios that account for uh, rapid abatement and decrease of CO2 actually all involved uh, technology in a way or another. So these are scenario that account for the development, the rapid development and implementation of different technological solutions to remove uh, car CO2 from the atmosphere. This can be done on land, this can be in the ocean and anything. And interestingly, while these uh, scenarios are often taken into consideration, many of these technology are actually uh, only uh, emerging at, at the moment and, and none of them has been um, yet deployed at regional industrial scale. But if you have a, a, a quick look at the, um, at the marine carbon cycle, so this is, this is a very schematic illustration of the marine carbon cycle with di different reservoir uh, and their reactivity or the, their time scales of transfer. So you can see that the atmosphere, surface, ocean and terrestrial biosphere are all very well connected. They're almost in equilibrium at least on, on decadal time scales and they're all approximately uh, the same size. Now, if we consider the deep ocean, so the deep ocean is a bit less reactive, right? The deep ocean is isolated from the atmosphere on, on centuries to millennia, and actually contains about 60 times more carbon than, than the atmosphere. And most of this carbon that is sequestered in the deep ocean is of natural uh, origin. So there's very little anthropogenic CO2 in the deep ocean as of yet. And since the Industrial uh, Revolution, 1850, the global ocean has absorbed 30% of our CO2 emissions. So the ocean is already uh, buffering uh, the increase in atmospheric CO2, okay? And as I said, one of the um, attractive or the advantages of the deep ocean, although it doesn't provide a definitive or really long-term geological um, um, reservoir for carbon, it can store carbon for, as I said, centuries to millennia. So at least it's not a permanent solution, but it will buy us time if we can, uh, if we achieve to transfer carbon in a form or the other from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. So all of the methods that I'm going to talk about are essentially uh, methods to increase the efficiency of the transfer of carbon between the surface ocean and the atmosphere into the deep ocean. And initially we thought that increasing carbon sequestration in the deep ocean uh, could be an advantage compared to the surface ocean because the deep ocean uh, harbors uh, much reduced biodiversity. At least we think, and um, recent study actually showed that this may not be the case. It's just because we don't know the deep ocean so well. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two different uh, methods. One is related to ocean fertilization. We can fertilize the ocean as in the same way as we fertilize land by add, adding fertilizers such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. Okay. And the other is the modification of ocean chemistry and enhanced uh, uh, weathering. Okay. So one way, so one way to increase the transfer of carbon from the ocean surface to the deep ocean involves biology. So uh, CO2 or carbon is fixed in, in the surface ocean by phytoplankton, algae, okay? And part of these organic matter is then transferred to the deep ocean, okay? However, the, the, the transfer of carbon in the form of organic matter to the deep ocean is relatively inefficient. Approximately, maybe less than 10% of the carbon that is produced in the surface ocean where there is light to, uh, to, uh, for photosynthesis is then eventually exported. A large part of this carbon is being recycled uh, in the upper ocean, in the upper 100, 200 meters um, as, uh, as part of organic matter respiration. So there's no net effect on CO2 based on that, on that short loop, okay? So the idea here, uh, if you want to sequester 
CO2 or enhance the sequestration of CO2 is really to increase the transfer or what we call the export of organic carbon from the surface into the deep ocean. By deep ocean, I mean everything that is deeper than say 500 meters, okay? And there, the CO2, so the organic matter that is not being remineralized at the surface will be remineralized and sequestered in um, the deep ocean and can be accumulated there. So if we have a look at uh, today's organic, uh, particular organic export here uh, with warm color uh, suggesting high efficiency of this particular organic export, we can see that most of the regions where organic carbon is being transferred efficiently to the ocean interior is mostly in polar oceans. Okay, so in the North Pacific here, North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean. One reason is that these regions are cold and the respiration or remineralization of organic matter is much slower in uh, under cold temperature. Okay, so this is one reason is the temperature. The second reason is related to the availability of uh, nutrients. So um, here's the case of nitrate, but it's the case also for phosphate and silicate and other nutrients. These nutrients are extremely enriched and actually in excess of what the phytoplankton community can use uh, in the ocean. You can see that in most of the ocean, in the tropical or subtropical ocean, there is no excess nutrient. So the, the phytoplankton community is very efficient at using these nutrients and then exporting carbon to the uh, deep ocean, but it's not the case in those polar oceans. So there are two reasons, right? Excess nutrients and cold temperatures. Now, if you look at how efficient um, ocean biology is as stripping out nutrient and exporting it to the, to the deep ocean, uh, there's a rather counterintuitive observation, okay? Again, in the tropical and subtropical ocean, the biological community is very efficient in taking up nutrients and then exporting. So in a way, the system is functioning at about approximately 100% efficiency. There is no way or no easy way to stimulate uh, productivity even more, okay? However, if you look at these um, a polar region and to some extent the equatorial Pacific, the uh, transfer of organic carbon from the surface uh, in the ocean is very inefficient. So at least there's in theory room to enhance uh, this process uh, on, on at least a regional scale. And this relates to the lack of one essential micronutrient to life, which is iron. Okay, so we also need iron uh, in our blood. So it, in, in other words, some of the, some parts of the ocean are anemic. Okay, so an iron is very, is essential for phytoplankton in order to fix carbon. So when iron is missing, phytoplankton start, uh, stops growing essentially. And so there have been some tests to, uh, in the late uh, 80s uh, in, in vitro first, where uh, scientists collected waters, so natural wa seawater from the, those regions, okay, that, that were naturally rich in major nutrients, such as nitrate and phosphate, and added iron to them. And, and after a few days of iron treatment, they could see that these um, experiments actually showed much higher phytoplankton production when compared um, to, the, to the control experiment. Okay. And so there's this very famous sentence uh, by, by the late John Martin, who said, give me half a tanker of iron and I'll give you the next ice age. And, and the idea here is you can stimulate ocean ecosystems by adding or dumping iron into the ocean. And these, are, these were uh, those experiments that were undertaken in the 90s and early 2000s, where scientists went out on ships, dumped dissolved iron in seawater and actually uh, investigated um, A, the stimulation of uh, the ecosystems and the invasion of CO2. And there have been a whole series of a series of uh, iron uh, fertilization experiment in, in the world ocean, mostly focused on these high nutrient regions, so the North Pacific, the equatorial uh, Pacific, and, and the Southern Ocean. And so I'm just gonna show you the results of one uh, of these experiments, which is called Ceres, which took place in the North Sea Pacific. And so what was fascinating, and it, and it provided very absolutely fascinating images. You can see this is a um, chlorophyll concentration as seen from space. 
okay, the North Sea Pacific. You can see here Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island, uh, Alaska, and so on. So you can see that most of the ocean is extremely productive in uh, along the coast, where most of the nutrients are being supplied by rivers. And you can see that in the middle of the ocean here is a very small patch of enhanced chlorophyll concentration, and this is the patch or the bloom, phytoplankton bloom, that was generated with the addition of iron. Okay, so it seems that at least on the first principle, adding iron to a region, to a, a region in the world ocean that was replete with major nutrients, stimulated uh, ocean, so phytoplankton growth. I'm going to guide you through uh, this, this um, maybe this complex figure, but this shows you. So this is the time series of in and out during this iron fertilization experiment. So we can see the upper left panel. So this, these are time series through time. So but these experiments take about 20, 20, uh, 20 days or so. There's a pulsed addition of iron to the surface ocean. Okay, so this is, and, and you can compare to the control with the open circle. So there's a, a, actually a lot of iron. There's a huge stimulation, a huge supply of iron to the surface ocean. And then you can rapidly see that this iron is declining as the iron is being taken up by phytoplankton. Okay, so you add iron in the surface ocean, part of it is dissipated by ocean circulation, but a, a large fraction of it is actually utilized by the phytoplankton community. And no surprise, um, once iron is being consumed, you see a, an increase in organic carbon in the surface ocean, okay? So as expected, based on in vitro experiments, uh, adding iron to the ocean actually increases its fertility. And you can see here the, the increase in the concentration of chlorophyll that we saw previously on the, on the satellite image. However, what happened as well very quickly is that the other nutrients that are essential for phytoplankton growth also got, got depleted very rapidly. So there's a very rapid pulse and transient pulse of chlorophyll during the experiment that rapidly declines after because other nutrients become missing. So many of these experiments actually showed that adding iron is indeed stimulating organic carbon production, but it's only a very transient um, uh, response, okay? And so the net effect, I mean, it's a huge cost to bring a ship out to the ocean, dump iron to the ocean for a very little for very little gain and all of them all of these experiments under very different biogeochemical conditions actually had a very small response on carbon or co2 uptake and maybe i should just make a there's a little maybe a little bit a little anecdote um the earth's climate already run such a, a large-scale iron fertilization experiment during the last ice age so it lasted about fifty thousand years during the last ice age, the iron concentration or iron supply to the ocean was enhanced by a factor of two to three. So most of the iron is supplied uh, to the ocean via dust, so atmospheric dust. So there was more dust produced during the last glacial maximum because the climate was more arid, because the winds were stronger. Okay, So we had a long-term sustained 50,000 year long experiment with a global scale iron fertilization. And the end result of that experiment was a reduction of 40 ppm CO2. So which, you know, which, which is half the glacial to glacial CO2 reduction, but is only in a way approximately 10 year worth of CO2 uh, emission. So showing that, that these uh, mechanisms, iron ex uh, fertilization experiments are not very efficient at sequestering CO2 in the uh, deep ocean. Right, so the second um, uh, method or approach has been taken, and, and as I said, is gaining a lot of traction uh, at the moment, is ocean alkalinization, or in a way very easily is just titrating or buffering the dissolved inorganic carbon we're adding in the ocean. So this is the experiment we're running now. We're increasing the dissolution of CO2 in the ocean, which has very adverse effect. For example, decreasing the pH, as you can see here, the pH values, okay, pH is decreasing, which leads to uh, ocean acidification in the surface, which is very, with deleterious effects to um, surface ocean ecosystem. So the idea here is to add alkalinity or basis, so a base to, to buffer that. Okay, so you have to add a huge amount of alkalinity 
to counter the invasion or absorption of CO2 in the surface ocean. So conceptually, it's fairly straightforward. And again, uh, these, uh, these experiments have been, have been run on a, on a global scale uh, for very long. And actually the, the enhanced weathering or weathering of silicate and carbonate on land and their eventual transport of alkalinity to the ocean um, is a mechanism that has controlled CO2 concentration on the very long time, uh, time scale on the earth, on the order of millions of years, okay? So we know the reactions pretty well, but they're extremely slow. Okay, so the idea here with this new method is just to enhance or strengthen those reactions by adding, um, um, if you want, the a base uh, and dissolving them into the ocean. Okay, so there's a few equations. Don't be scared. I just want to make two uh, two points, two major points here. So these are the equation um, that. Um, that shows you the, the carbonate weathering and the silicate weathering. And here you can see that the weathering of carbonate and silicate consume CO2 and actually with silicate weathering twice as much CO2 than for carbonate, okay? And, and these uh, then bound into a bicarbonate, which is dissolved in the ocean. However, what is quite remarkable is that the, the scale of the operation is very inefficient. In a way, it's a mole to mole ratio between the mineral element you add to the ocean and the carbon that is sequestered. So essentially you have to add on, on the, in the mole ratio as much um, uh, lime or, or silicate in a way, then you have to remove CO2. So it's not a factor for of one to 1000, it's one to one, okay? The second aspect here is that the, the so-called liming process, okay, which is one of the processes that um, that, uh, that is maybe the most advanced at the moment, you have to cook calcium carbonate in order to dissociate it. And, uh, and this reaction actually generates CO2. So not only you have to have a lot of energy to cook or to burn calcium carbonate, but this process actually releases CO2, which is exactly the opposite than what you would do. So, so these processes are extremely complex and also require the immediate sequestration at the power plant where this lime is being um, produced, okay? And now I wanna make, just to finish, maybe a, some interesting theoretical consideration. And this is very, very simplistic. So I'm sorry, uh, um, I already apologize for all the physicists and economists in the room, but to just to get an idea of the, of the scale of the investment or of the endeavor that it requires. So an average a human being, emits about three kilograms per CO2, uh, of CO2 per day, okay? And of course, there are wide and huge uh, heterogeneities. But so just as a, as a thought experiment, let's keep that, that amount in mind, okay? So the, the, the calcium carbonate or, or the silicate that you need to add, they're about eight times uh, heavier in a way. If it's one mole per one mole, but the mole of calcium carbonate or silicate is eight times as, uh, or eight to five times as heavy. So essentially, if you want to abate uh, our CO2 emissions, it requires the addition of 10 to say 25 kilograms of carbonate or silicate to the ocean per day to the ocean. Okay, so I'm not saying that we should only use this method to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, but it just gives you a sense on the daunting task that these, um, that these methods require. And so if we, again, a very um, uh, back of the envelope calculation, right? if, if we count that one ton of CO2 costs about $100 nowadays, uh, if you want to remove the four gigatons of CO2 that we're emitting on a yearly basis, it would cost approximately $4 trillion per year, okay? which is about 5% of the global GDP. Right. And, and just as a point of comparison, the global COVID-19 relief programs that have been announced and not implemented yet uh, amount $1.3 trillion. So essentially we would have to invest three times the global COVID-19 relief programs every year if you wanted to remove CO2 from the atmosphere using that enhanced weathering method. 
Right, so to conclude, removing CO2 from the atmosphere is really hard, okay? And there's no catalyzer for these uh, reactions, uh, okay? So, so removing CO2 from the atmosphere is, is expensive and logistically involved and, and evolved. And so these methods are practically infeasible. Infeasible. The ecosystem, uh, ecosystemic consequences are largely unknown and there's only a very emerging field of studies. We don't know uh, the, the consequences for, uh, for marine ecosystems on the, on the long time scales. The public ac accept Stability is uh, uncertain. I would say it is rather negative. People or the society is rather unhappy to see scientists play with their oceans. Okay, and and maybe one of the most important take-home message here is that there's no single solution that we can apply to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, so we probably need to have a, an entire portfolio of solution of mechanisms to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Right, thank you very much for your uh, attention. And I'm very happy uh, to take any question that may, may arise. Thank you. To invite our next speaker, who is Dimitrios Lignos. He's a, an associate professor in civil engineering at the NAC at EPFL. So Dimitri, why don't you go ahead and just share your presentation and directly start. Okay, can you see? Absolutely. Okay, well, <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Thanos, for the uh, nice introduction. <clears throat> uh, so I'm uh, going to uh, talk uh, regarding uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, in particular how it uh, behaves uh, when uh, it's exposed to natural hazards. And uh, then I will try to link the talk uh, with future challenges related to climate. And uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank the uh, organizers for this uh, excellent seminar series and for the invitation to uh, pretty much uh, present this uh, talk. And also, uh, this is also a nice opportunity to, uh, to thank uh, everybody related to Climac at uh, UNIL and EPFL because this gives us opportunities to also uh, talk to each other uh, and see how we could potentially collaborate. So hopefully this talk will provide some ideas uh, and opportunities for discussion. And uh, so to start, I, I, when I talk about natural hazards today, it will be mostly related to uh, earthquakes. And uh, so suppose you have a nice piece of land, uh, it could be in Sion, and uh, we would like to build uh, an asset like the one that you see in the figure. And uh, since I mentioned Sion, uh, normally there are faults uh, that you should also take into consideration. And uh, because uh, faults eventually rupture, uh, what typically happens is you get uh, energy release, which is transmitted with uh, wave propagation. And eventually you are basically uh, getting uh, some sort of acceleration uh, series underneath your asset. And essentially what this does is uh, you're going to experience some vibration. Now in this fairly uh, complex process, there are several uncertainties that uh, would impact not only the anticipated uh, behavior, but also other issues related to functionality in the aftermath of the uh, earthquake in this case, as well as repairs uh, uh, we, that we may need to consider over uh, the life cycle, because as we have experienced from earthquakes, usually uh, structures or infrastructure in general uh, ends up being damaged. And uh, if we consider what we really do today in terms of uh, engineering of these uh, assets, so a civil engineer today would usually follow a prescriptive uh, approach to uh, basically uh, come up with a design. Uh, it will uh, design to ensure life safety, which is of course number one, but not uh, continuous functionality. And uh, for instance, if you know you have an earthquake and uh, bridge network uh, shuts down, although not collapsed, uh, this is going to be a huge uh, uh, impact in terms of downtime because you're not going to be able to go to work, uh, and th there are some uh, associated losses that you have to factor when you actually take this uh, design in, in in the design process. And the other thing is that uh, usually we care about minimizing initial cost but not cost over the entire uh, life cycle. Now, if you want to measure success uh, in, what, uh, in this process, 
An example among many uh, is, uh, for instance, a recent, a recent earthquake, well, not that recent anymore, but about a decade ago in uh, New Zealand, which is a well-developed country. And uh, although the event was not uh, very, very large, let's say, uh, the total cost to insurers of rebuilding was approximately, approximately 40 billion uh, New Zealand uh, dollars, which corresponds to uh, about 20% of the uh, New Zealand GDP. On the other hand, life safety was pre uh, preserved, I'm sorry for the typo, in most cases, which is obviously good. So uh, if you, uh, uh, if you uh, think about this, uh, this is not, let's say, success is relative because it's not, this doesn't demonstrate, let's say, uh, 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 success because uh, according to the current paradigm, at least for quick hazards, uh, we see that we stagger repair costs in the aftermath of the uh, event. We have huge downtime and uh, also we have displaced population because if uh, your house is not uh, operational. You have to figure out where to go so that, so that you could, you know, live at least temporarily somewhere. Now, if you uh, would like to relate this to uh, climate change, uh, the, it is likely uh, that the above challenges will uh, be exacerbated because uh, uh, the way we the way we uh, you know think about earthquakes, the, these are like normally um, we think about short term. Whereas in reality, if you have uh, materials that are exposed to uh, extreme uh, weather cycles and uh, followed by an earthquake and vice versa, uh, obviously the material performance uh, is, and overall the system performance uh, is going to be compromised. And this is something we don't really uh, consider in today's uh, process. Uh, now, uh, a different way of, uh, uh, designing, let's say, uh, would be to target the performance. And um, if you target the performance, you could uh, potentially factor aspects related to downtime or like uh, uh, if you are uh, more interested about cost, but at the same time, you would like to use more advanced materials in uh, construction, you would like to see if you really get a benefit uh, if you encapsulate these factors in the design. Moreover, if you are a stakeholder uh, and you are, uh, or like a reinsurer, uh, you would like to see if you are uh, offering insurance for like um, high tech infrastructure, uh, if um, uh, let's say the premiums you are offering uh, make sense or not. So, uh, in, in uh, so we can, we could you know we can do this uh, and in the context of earthquakes this uh, is a framework called the performance based earthquake engineering framework where if I use my pen uh, where what we try to do is that uh, uh, by starting this is a bottom up approach and uh, essentially what we try to do here is that uh, if we would like to uh, uh, eventually establish policy because we are stakeholders, we are not engineers. Uh, the way you could do this is that uh, you could uh, start by some, somehow formulating your hazard, uh, let's say as a function of something that, you know, we could call it intensity measure in this case. Then eventually you could use, uh, uh, if you are more in computer science or simulation, you could be uh, taking that hazard, which is not in your domain, you could be using a simulation to uh, quantify performance. And then eventually, if you know perfor the performance, you could uh, link this to a damage measure that people understand. And again, given that you have a damage measure, you could relate this to a decision uh, variable that could be losses, downtime, injuries, or uh, fatalities. And um, uh, mathematically, uh, this can be expressed with a triple integral. And uh, this is the triple integral that Thanos was uh, looking at the very beginning. And uh, uh, essentially, if you look at this triple integral, what, what it tells you is that uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, you can combine your hazard with, uh, let's say, the complex quantity here uh, relates to performance models and simulation. And, and on the other side, uh, you basically have your impact. 
and the impact essentially uh, you can express it as the mean annual frequency of collapse or losses or downtime or injuries and so on. And uh, mean annual frequency is uh, a good way to do this because uh, since we are talking about uh, uncertainties that come into this process, uh, essentially you take into account these uncertainties and the answer you are giving is not, let's say a deterministic answer, but essentially it, uh, it, it is expressed as a mean annual frequency of uh, pretty much your, your uh, performance objective. Now, uh, if I uh, take the uh, integral uh, and uh, you, the way you should uh, look at this is that you could contrast it with what you try to accomplish or what we try to accomplish in uh, CLIMAC. Uh, because uh, since you're trying to form policy, right, you could think about your hazard with some sort of metric that uh, um, uh, given this metric, it will basically cause something to an infrastructure or to a system you're monitoring. Now, given what you are getting from that, you are going to measure some sort of uh, damage, let's say, when we talk about infrastructure. And again, given that damage, you have to basically decide what you're going to do. So if you uh, look at this uh, integral, essentially uh, this is an application of the total probability theorem that you could uh, apply it anyhow you like uh, to formulate a problem uh, with a huge heterogeneity. And uh, it facilitates the solution of a challenging problem in pieces. And uh, most importantly, uh, different specialists can work on different aspects of the problem. And this uh, relates to what, for instance, Thanos was uh, discussing uh, last week on the modeling challenges that we're talking about different models coming into play. But the question is, you know, how do you link them together? So, so here, every time you say given, right, you could think what this given parameter you want to transfer from one specialist to the other would be and by essentially using the triple integral you could measure impact uh, in a fairly uh, quantitative way uh, and uh, and uh, i'll give you an example in a minute regarding this matter and uh, when i say different specialists uh, consider that for instance in the case of an earthquake in the hazard uh, we would like high seismologists to uh, to uh, to be engaged uh, whereas in the uh, second part, we'd like more, you know, structural engineers or material scientists to come into play uh, and essentially uh, inform uh, about how materials behave and how we could leverage this information to a system. And then eventually, if we would like to uh, leverage a decision variable associated with uh, downtime, uh, uh, other disciplines uh, will have to come into play because uh, including aspects of human behavior and so on that, that you could factor here. Now, uh, uh, the, the uh, expensive but uh, necessary requirement in this uh, endeavor is uh, multi-scale heterogeneous modeling of the physical problem I showed. But uh, I mean, uh, this, at least for infrastructure, could be done. Uh, by actually using uh, parameterized simulation models and uh, by basically uh, uh, talking to different specialists so that you can factor the uh, different aspects of the uh, model uh, in what you're trying to simulate, you could basically uh, come up with, uh, again, as I said, the quantitative uh, uh, value of uh, what you're trying to uh, target as anticipated performance. And uh, I'll give you an example. This is in my field, but I mean, you can take it in your field as well. So uh, the objective here was to uh, design a high performance alloy that you see pretty much here, uh, that uh, when you use it in an asset, uh, that uh, you know its location, uh, the probability of collapse uh, for the uh, 2,475 year earthquake uh, will not exceed 20%. So basically my performance objective, uh, when I measure the probability of collapse, given the uh, intensity of the event that I'm interested, should not exceed 20%. So uh, uh, if we uh, think about the, uh, the process here, like uh, again, we uh, take the alloy in collaboration with the material science, we come to our lab, we test it, so we uh, get some sort of uh, quantitative information regarding the macroscopic uh, performance of the uh, material. 
and then by using uh, uh, material laws, we could uh, eventually inform our simulation platform that essentially relates to a uh, system. And by leveraging the uh, triple integral uh, that I demonstrated here, I would like my impact to be translated to a probability of collapse over uh, uh, the building, building life expectancy. And uh, let's say uh, by actually doing so, uh, and by exploring uh, material variations here, uh, you can actually get the anticipated performance you're looking uh, with some sort of uh, error or with some sort of variability. But essentially uh, for the anticipated event that I'm looking, I am basically designing with a material B that actually satisfies the performance objective of interest. And you could do this by, uh, by uh, for instance, you could uh, take it one step further if you uh, would like to associate this with uh, expected losses, uh, annualized losses uh, that you don't want to spend on repairs uh, on your building, let's say over 50 years, again, you could uh, uh, interpret the impact as uh, this sort of annualized expected losses. And again, you will have an approach that relates material science all the way up to insurance. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, so if if you uh, if if we would like to so so it seems like it seems like we are uh, basically uh, while it seems that we have a platform to actually uh, design infrastructure for performance although we don't do it at least for most of the structure we design today uh, there are certain challenges due to climate change to be considered in the uh, performance based uh, engineering process and, and uh, as I said at the beginning climate change has raised infrastructure vulnerability to uh, natural hazards. Uh, because of uh, cascading events primarily. And in particular, it would be good to uh, develop climate models that depict uh, time evolution of regional characteristics, along with other uh, modalities such as uh, temperature, humidity, uh, precipitation, winds, as well as others. And uh, with this data, you could, uh, or we could use uh, laboratory mockups uh, in situ uh, sensing to study uh, cascading effects on uh, construction materials and systems. And uh, one aspect related to modeling uh, is that uh, we, are, we are lacking of multi-fidelity uh, simulation models for predicting predictive maintenance uh, during uh, cascading events that depict uh, time-dependent uh, phenomena. And finally, uh, if you want to formulate policy, the question is you know, how to rationalize design decisions for infrastructure in terms of uh, quantitative metrics that could be annualized probabilities of, of collapse that somebody has to accept over like 50 years or like 100 years of uh, infrastructure life expectancy or uh, uh, expected annual losses and so on and so forth. So, to summarize my uh, presentation, uh, when I look at the uh, when I look at the uh, and I borrowed this slide from the climate workshops. Uh, so when I look at the climate uh, modeling platform, uh, and I look at these pieces that you are putting here, to me, you know, I, I see this as the hazard. I see this as my modeling aspect. And I see the third one as the policy or the metrics I need to basically relate with the above uh, to form some policy. So if I think about, again, how you could uh, potentially formulate and uh, solve the problem uh, or attempt to solve the problem, it could be that uh, you could think along the lines of the triple integral I showed you earlier. And uh, perhaps uh, this uh, will take us to, uh, to uh, an interesting uh, solution. So with that, uh, th th this was supposed to be a 20 minute talk so that uh, we can stimulate some discussion. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your kind attention. And if you have any, uh, any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to, uh, to chat. Thank you.